Hello, everybody. I can see a few of you. Max and Mallory, I see you. Um, can you hear me? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up. Excellent. Welcome, everybody, to another webinar with the Dolphin Communication Project. I'm Kel. Um, today, we're going to be talking about just some introductory information about dolphins. Um, last week, we started talking about some specifics, and we decided to say, whoa, hold on. Let's get everybody on the same page and uh, learn some things about what dolphins are, which fins are which, what they do, things like that. Um, so a reminder, Dr. Kathleen is monitoring the chat, so type your questions to her. I think the only option might be to type to everyone. Um, we're still figuring that out a bit, um, but we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the talk. And remember, we're recording this, um, so if you don't want anyone to see you, make sure that camera's off and make sure your microphones are off too. Um, the recording will be archived on DCP's website and on our YouTube channel. So today, we will introduce you to some basics about dolphins. Um, first, just a space where you can learn more later. Um, this is a screenshot of our website and it's the Adopt a Dolphin section and you can find that under Ways to Help. Um, so if your parents let you or if they can help you, you can go there and you can learn about these dolphins. They're Atlantic spotted dolphins that we've observed off the coast of Bimini, which is a small island in the Bahamas where I'm calling you from. Um, and I wanted to remind everybody that we're going to give away a free electronic adoption kit to one lucky participant or family um, who's joining us today. So if you want to be entered into the drawing, make sure you submit your email address to the chat there. Um, if you can't submit it directly just to Kathleen and you don't want other people to see it, you can email us and uh, Scouts Honor that you were really here today. Um, We'll add you to our email newsletter database if you're not already, and then we'll enter you into the drawing. So, what is a dolphin? I know I can't hear you, but you can talk. So some of you are with your siblings or your friends or your teacher, um, your parents. What is a dolphin? What do you think the answer is? Do you think it's a fish, a mammal, or perhaps an alien from a yet to be discovered planet? Hmm. Hmm. You can write your answers into the chat if you want. Let's see what the right answer is. A dolphin is a mammal. That's right. Dolphins are mammals. That was an easy question. But what makes a mammal a mammal? Hmm. So go ahead, type some ideas into that chat box if you want. Talk to whoever's in the room with you. See if you can suggest some ideas. What makes a mammal a mammal? Let's see, I see some, some suggestions going in there. I'm gonna give you a few to choose from too. Does it breathe air? Does it have mammary glands? That's a big word. Uh, to make milk for babies? Does it have hair at least at some point? Does it have three tiny bones in the middle ear to help it hear? And does it like to play dress up? Which of those do you think are the right answers? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, one, two, three, and four are all things that it, you have to have in order to be a mammal. You do not have to like to play dress up to be a mammal. I, d I don't know who put that choice up there. Um, so a human, you can see a human swimmer here. Humans, we're all mammals. But is a shark a mammal? Nope. So sharks, like all fish, are not mammals. How about a lion? Oh, lions, like all cats, are mammals. They have all four of these things. A pelican or other birds, not mammals. So now that we know what a mammal is, do you think a dolphin is a whale? Is a dolphin a type of whale? Yes, there's the yes. Yes, it is, but I have a riddle for you. Ready? All dolphins are whales, but not all whales are dolphins. You guys wanna say that with me? Cause, huh? 
all dolphins are whales, but not all whales are dolphins. Let's figure out what that means. So this is kind of a chart to figure out how scientists classify all the living things on planet Earth. So way up top in a big group, we have a subphylum. Some of the older kids listening might already know what that is, but we have a subphylum vertebrata. Those are the vertebrates. We all have this backbone going down. That's our vertebrae. Not all vertebrates are mammals, but some of them are. So underneath vertebrates is the class mammalia, the mammals. Not all mammals are cetaceans, but some mammals are cetaceans. That means that they're in the order cetacea. And cetacean is just a fancy science word for whale. So all the cetaceans are all whales, but some of those whales have teeth, like us. But some of those whales have something called baleen. Have some of you heard of baleen? So a humpback whale in the picture here, this is an example of a baleen whale. They don't have any teeth like us, but they have these long strips in their mouth. And the strips are actually made out of the same thing as your fingernails and your hair. Pretty cool, huh? And they use that like a big giant strainer. Like if you're helping cook dinner and one of your parents is straining spaghetti and they can scoop up teeny, teeny, tiny food and they use their tongue and they push out all the water and all the tiny food gets stuck in their baleen and then they can eat it. Toothed whales have teeth just like us. And then within the toothed whales, here's a picture of a big sperm whale, there are dolphins. Dolphins are in the family Delphinidae. And within the dolphin group, we have bottlenose dolphins and spotted dolphins. Those are the two species of dolphins that the scientists at DCP study. And if you go backwards up this slide, everything below is what the thing above it is. So bottlenose dolphins and spotted dolphins are dolphins. Dolphins are toothed whales. Toothed whales are whales. Baleen whales are whales, but look, there's no line there. So baleen whales are not also dolphins. So going backwards, let's see if it'll let me go backwards. So all whales are dolphins. I said that backwards. All dolphins are whales, but not all whales are dolphins. So you can go home. I see some of you are at school. You can go home and try and say that to your parents or your big cousins or aunties and see if you can help them figure it out. So how many species of dolphins do you think there might be? In the whole world living right now, how many species of dolphins do you think there might be? Do you think that there are 200, 21, 37, or 94 species of dolphins? Have some ideas? <gasps> 37 species of dolphins are currently recognized by scientists, plus some dolphins that live in rivers, plus porpoises. Because when we say dolphins, we do not mean porpoises. They are different. And you know what the thing about scientists? They don't always agree. And we don't always have all of the information. So we have to keep studying and keep learning and keep making new discoveries. We make those discoveries out in the field when we're on boats and we're searching for animals. And we make those discoveries in the laboratory, studying the genetics of the animals. So by the time our younger listeners are in charge, the answer to this question could be different. So now let's talk about the body of a dolphin. So the belly, of a dolphin or the underside is the ventral side of the dolphin. And that means the back of the dolphin is called the dorsal side. So anything from kind of the middle and across the back is the dorsal side and anything on the belly is the ventral side. 
And here are all their body parts, or at least some of them. So up top at their forehead, that's called the melon. You don't want to confuse it with a cantaloupe or a watermelon, but it's called the melon. Just behind that is the blowhole and the mouth of a dolphin. Anybody know what that's actually called? That's the rostrum. Then working our way back, they have pectoral fins on the sides of their bodies, so two pectoral fins. The big fin on the back of their body is the dorsal fin, which makes sense because it's a fin on the dorsal side of the body. And then this big area here, that's called the peduncle. Took me a long time to be able to say that. The peduncle or the tail stalk, and then the fluke or their tail is back here. So those are the body parts. Now, what do each of these parts do? First, let's talk about the blowhole. How many nostrils do you guys have? How many? Two, two. I see them, I see them. Humans have two nostrils, just like baleen whales. Remember we talked about baleen whales, like the humpback whale? But dolphins only have one. So they have one hole in the top of their head, and that's their blowhole. Since dolphins live in the water, even though they breathe air, do you think it would be better if this blowhole stayed closed and then they had to try and open it? Or do you think it would be more helpful if it was just open all the time while they were swimming around? Do you like to swim with your mouth open? Probably not, huh? No. <laughs> so the neutral position of the blowhole or the position that it's in most of the time is actually closed, which means dolphins have to consciously come up to the surface, open the blowhole and take a breath. Sometimes people call this voluntary breathing, but that's a little misleading because they can't exactly just choose not to go take a breath. It's better to think of it as conscious breathing. And really it just means that they can't fall all the way asleep. If a dolphin falls all the way asleep, it will stop breathing. You and I, do we get to just keep breathing when you go down for nap or you go to sleep at the end of the day? You just keep on breathing, huh? Right? Well, a dolphin can't do that. So its blowhole is closed. It has to come up to the surface. It exhales first and then inhales and close, closes that blowhole again. Any ideas as to why it's on the top of the head? Our noses are at the front of our face. Has anyone ever gone snorkeling before with a mask and a snorkel? Was it pretty helpful to have that snorkel going up to the top of your head so you could look down while you were swimming and you could see what was going on, <sighs> but you could still breathe out your snorkel, right? So for the dolphins and whales, it's much, much easier to have their blowhole at the top of their head. That way, <gasps> they don't have to lift their whole face out of the water to take a breath. So now that we've talked about the blowhole, we can talk about the melon, that forehead of the dolphin. Inside the forehead is this melon, and it's the same density as seawater. So this means that when the dolphin produces its echolocation sound, the sound wave leaves an area of one density, and it goes into the water, an area of the same density. And this allows the echolocation signal, the sound that they're sending out, to be very precise in its direction. If it was going from one density to another, the sound would wiggle through the water. And dolphins don't want that. If they want to investigate something in front of them, they want to make sure their echolocation sound goes right where they pointed to. That sound wave, that echolocation is going to bounce off whatever's in front of the dolphin, and an echo is going to come back to the dolphin. But the echo doesn't go to their ears. It actually is received through the lower jaw. Isn't that cool? So scientists know where echolocation is produced and they know how it's received 
but they don't really know how it's processed. But we do know that dolphins can learn a lot of information about the world around them through their echolocation. Now on to the nose. Nope, no noses here. Even though one of the most well-known dolphins is a bottle nose dolphin, dolphins don't have noses. They likely don't even have a sense of smell, but they do have a sense of taste. Now we'll move on to those fins, the dorsal fin and the pectoral fin. The dorsal fin, remember that's on the dorsal side of their body or the back of their body, it may aid in stability. But if a dolphin loses its dorsal fin, as long as it survives that injury, it doesn't swim around all wobbly in the sea. It's still pretty stable, it does just fine. And there are some species that have hardly any dorsal fin at all. But these fins and the tail fluke, they might aid in the dolphin regulating its temperature. And regulating your temperature, the big word for that is thermoregulation. The pectoral fins are the two fins on each side of the dolphin's body. These fins help the dolphin steer and stop. And they're also important for communication and relationship building with other dolphins. Do you guys sometimes high five your friends? Yeah? If, if a friend asks for a back scratch, do you sometimes go over and, and give, them, give them a hand? Yeah? Well, dolphins use their pectoral fins for communication and relationship building too. And next, next month, Dr. Kathleen is going to lead a webinar talking about pectoral fin contact. But sometimes a dolphin can lose its pectoral fin. This is a dolphin that we used to study here in the Bahamas called Nemo. We called her Nemo. Um, she lost her pectoral fin. When we first saw her, we weren't sure if it was an injury or if she was born that way. But I'm gonna show you a little video of her in a moment. If the pectoral fins are for steering and for stopping, do you think Nemo swam in circles and crashed into stuff? Nope, she did just fine. So hopefully the video will play. Um, I'm going to try and make sure the sound is off, which I forgot to do at the beginning, so that you can hear my voice too. So this was recorded way back in 2008, before some of you were born. And you can see Nemo, she can still swim around just fine. And like I mentioned, we weren't sure when we first saw her in 2003, if she was born without her pectoral fin or if something happened to it. And the reason we think it was an injury and we think something happened to it is because over that first summer, way back in 2003, it was still healing. The color changed, how it looked changed. So we're pretty sure it was an injury. She survived the injury, it healed up. And as you can see, she's not swimming in circles unless she wants to, and she's not crashing into anything or anyone. It did mean that she couldn't return pectoral fin rubs, high fives with the other dolphin on that side, but the dolphin still came up to her and they exchanged pectoral fin high fives with her on her good side. And she was a bit of a sassy dolphin. Sometimes she was a little rambunctious, playing a little rough on the playground, chasing other dolphins. But we really enjoyed watching her while we could and seeing that her injury didn't seem to slow her down one bit. And she chases Addie. Oops, too far. So now the last part of their body, the peduncle and the fluke. You can see here the peduncle, a tail stalk, and the fluke of a dolphin as it gets ready to dive. This is a bottlenose dolphin in the Bahamas. And the peduncle, this area is very, very strong. And one of the more curious things, one of the things that surprised scientists was that using their tail to swim, scientists would have thought that the most powerful part of their stroke, the most powerful part of their swimming, would have been as they push their tail down. But really, they get more power as they pull their tail up. So the power stroke 
is actually when the dolphin is pumping its tail up, which was a big surprise. So now that you guys know more about dolphins, what they are, how they're related to other animals, what their body parts are called, you can ask your parents or your teachers or your aunties if, you can, if they can go to our website um, to learn more. Um, here you can see a picture of our kids science activities page. You'll find that underneath the education tab. And here are all different PDFs that your grown-ups can download for you. Some coloring pages, some word searches, some activities. And we're going to try and add new stuff to this page over the next few weeks and months. So be sure to check back. And also under the education tab is our webinar page. So here up top, you'll see the schedule for the next few webinars. And then below, you'll see recordings. And later on this week, there'll be a recording of this one up here. And it will also be on our YouTube channel. So your grownups can search Dolphin Communication Project on YouTube. There's lots more information on our website, including our podcast, The Dolphin Pod. Um, so you can learn all sorts of things about dolphin communication, echolocation, all sorts of topics at The Dolphin Pod. You can get that on our website or wherever you get your podcasts. And then we have two types of webinars. So our DCP Dives Deep series is for older students. Um, this Thursday, it's going to be at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, and Dr. Alexis is going to tell us a bit about her research. She started out as a DCP intern, and now she has a PhD. Um, and often what scientists ask about dolphins is, how do they choose who their friends are? How do they choose who to hang out with? Well, Dr. Alexis worked with some other scientists to try to ask, how do they decide who to avoid? Maybe that's just as interesting to ask. She's also going to be sharing a little bit about her path. So high school and college listeners should bring their questions if you're interested in pursuing a career in marine biology or animal behavior. The other type of webinar is what this was, a dolphin lesson. And this is geared more towards elementary age kids. And there'll be another one on Tuesday, which will build on photo ID. And you can listen in next week and you can meet the bottlenose dolphins at Blue Lagoon Island, home of dolphin encounters in the Bahamas. So that's next Tuesday, again at one o'clock. Before we get to questions, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us. Um, and as a reminder, there are all these ways to stay in touch and learn more information. Um, send us your questions later if you think of extra ones. There are also ways to support DCP grownups who are listening. Um, and right now, anybody who does one of the, these three things that are starred, adopting a dolphin, becoming a member, getting a t-shirt or a face bandana, um, anyone who spends $15 or more on our website, you can suggest someone in your life, maybe an essential worker, a nurse, a doctor, a grocery store worker, or somebody who just needs a pick-me-up. Is life pretty weird right now for all of you? Stuff's kind of weird. Well, if you think somebody needs a pick-me-up, we will send them a free dolphin adoption kit as a thank you from you and DCP. So thank you all for listening. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kathleen to see what questions you have. Hello. How are you? And happy Tuesday to everybody. It is Tuesday, right? I think. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> uh, I actually, before I, I read any questions that might be there, I had a question for you, Cal. Ooh. In When you are observing the dolphins off of Bimini, is it difficult to tell the difference between the spotted and the bottlenose dolphins when you see them in real life? Good question. I would say that it used to be tricky so when people are first starting out and first meeting the dolphins, young spotted dolphins, guess what they don't have? No spots, zero uh -huh. spots on a baby spotted dolphin. So a baby spotted dolphin looks a lot like a bottlenose dolphin. So it's very easy, especially from the boat, as the dolphins first swim to the boat to say, oh, look, bottlenose dolphins. And then we say, oh, wait, those are just young spotted dolphins. Um, now that I've been doing this for 18 years, 
I don't know how I got so old. <laughs> I can tell them apart pretty quickly, pretty easily. Their dorsal fins are a little bit different. Their rostrums are a little bit different. Um, so the more time you spend with them, the easier it is to tell them apart. Very cool. We actually had a question asking about what is in the adoption kits. Ooh, lovely question. Um, so there are two types of dolphin adoption kits. There's a print version that's $35 and comes to your mailbox. And that has pictures of your dolphin, a biography, a little story about your dolphin, um, some other information about DCP, a certificate that has your name on it, says you adopted that dolphin, and two trading cards. It might not be your dolphin because it's random. Um, mm. Dolphin trading cards like baseball cards, but they're dolphins. And then you can get the same version, but that's just on your computer. And that's a little less expensive. And we email it to you and you can see on your computer, the photographs, the same certificate that says that you adopted the dolphin, a photo album of the dolphins. And then both kits come with a link and you can watch dolphin videos, including your adopted dolphin. Very cool. Very cool. I think it's pretty cool. I like watching them and learning about the dolphins when, when we observe them. So I think that's neat. Um, I don't have actually any more questions. Okay. I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to chat about. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think if we got any questions last week that people here might be interested in. Oh, oh, I just, I peeked at the chat. I saw someone asked about favorite dolphins and oh, I yes. am a scientist and scientists can't play favorites with who we study. We have to be very serious all the time and very, very objective. No, no, we don't. <laughs> My favorite dolphin in Bimini, her name is Little Jess. Her ID number in our photo ID catalog is number 35. And there is just something about little Jess that just, I'm smitten with her. Uh, maybe it's because I had really crooked teeth when I was a kid. And my jaw was all kind of twisted and she has an underbite. So she swims around and her lower jaw comes out a little bit too far. And she is a mom, I'm a mom. Um, and she's just really, really fun to, uh, to watch. And I've watched her every single summer. So I have seen her Very cool. 17 years in a row when I go out there to study them. Very cool. Very cool. You probably saw a little Jess when she was young, yep. right? She when had she only a her first few spots and now she's on her second calf, I think, Very the top cool. of my head. Do you, do you remember which two calves are hers? I don't think her calves have numbers. So one thing about telling the dolphins apart and studying them is that we have to be able to tell them apart. Um, and because the dolphins are born without spots, they all pretty much look the same. Um, so they can spend all this time with mom and we can follow them and we see them in June and we see them in July and then we see them the next year, but they don't have any marks on them. <laughs> and then they get some marks, but then they're not with their mom anymore. And it gets really hard to know for sure that that was the baby we used to be following. So if a calf gets some spots before she leaves her mom, or if they get an injury and it leaves a scar that we'll be able to see years later, then we can give them an ID number, add them to our photo ID catalog, and follow them through their lives and know who their mom was. Very cool. Mm -hmm. We did have a question. Um, well, we had a couple of questions about interns. Um, if we have any young interns in our programs and what the requirements are to be an intern. So do you, I don't, do you want to feel that? Sure. We do. All of our interns have to be in call or have to be college age. So more than 18. Um, we have interns at our Florida office where Dr. Kathleen is calling us from. And some of those interns in the summertime then can come out to Bimini with me and learn how we collect the data, learn what notes we take, how we use our GPS, um, how we do video uh, data collection, how we match photos to our photo ID catalog. And interns also have to help us teach. So when we're in Bimini, we interact with people who are here on vacation to see the dolphins. 
and we sneak some education into their vacations. Um, and we also lead college classes. So sometimes we have college students here. And if the interns are here at the same time, they have to help out with all of that too. Very cool. And then Kel, when did you get interested in dolphins? Mm. I've always been interested in marine mammals. I think somehow, even when I was a kid, the idea that they swam in the ocean but had to breathe air like us was very, mm -hmm. very interesting to me. And you all can look stuff up on the internet now, but when I was little, I had to ride my bicycle to the North Haven Library, and I would have my library card, and I would go and find whale and dolphin books and seals and sea lions, and I would look through the books, and then I would save my allowance, and I would photocopy the pages out of the books, and I would bring them home, and I would read them, and I'd paste them up on my wall. My walls were just covered in posters and encyclopedia articles. Um, so I was a goofy, nerdy kid who just loved science. And then in high school, probably once I was able to choose some of my own classes, anytime I had a chance to take an extra science class, that always seemed to be the class that I wanted to take. Very cool. Very cool. So I think if you're interested in science or you're interested in a particular animal, you can learn as much as you can about them and follow that along and then write to different scientists or people involved with those animals. And, and you guys can all do that as well and, you know, learn as you go. And then maybe at some point jump on the science bandwagon and learn even more about that particular animal or that particular topic. Yeah. And what we also need is people who aren't scientists to still care about the ocean and still care about the dolphins. So even if you grow up to be a cake baker, you can be a mm -hmm. cake baker who loves the ocean. And I see a question popped up for what are some education programs for high school kids who like to scuba dive? I'm guessing that mm -hmm. that question means. And see what you can do, volunteering at a local aquarium, mm -hmm. um, seeing if you can talk your family into a vacation that involves the ocean. When I was a kid, we always went to Cape Cod. Um, those mm -hmm. of you calling in from the Northeast might know where that is. And every summer, we just went up there for a week as a family and I got to drag my brothers along and we'd go on a whale watch and look for humpback whales and minke whales and right whales. Um, and that yep. left a, a big impression on me. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so DCP used to do um, some programs with middle school mm -hmm. students and, and early high school students. We haven't in a while, mm -hmm. but if you think that's something that you might want to talk to your teachers about um, when we can all leave our houses and travel again and things like that, um, stay in touch. You see our, our website and our email there. Talk to your grownups um, and who knows, maybe we can put something together. Yeah, that would be fun. That would be fun. We've done, we actually, DCP's done programs for all age groups, for elementary and junior high school and high school, as well as adults, and then general webinars and seminars and programs. So um, right now we're doing all of this from home and thankfully with the internet, because we all have to stay home, but you know, we'll see what happens when, when we can venture forth and do a little bit more. Yeah. So it'll be cool. So thank awesome. you, everybody. I see the one last question that's popped up, and then we'll probably wrap up. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how many whale species there are. So, and if that means all cetaceans, right? Because tooth whales, mm -hmm. baleen whales, and tooth whales includes dolphins and um, river dolphins. Um, but one place to look if you want to know that you're looking at the most reputable source, if you Google Society of Marine Mammalogy, mm -hmm. did I say it right? Um, yep, they the have of kind of what they've all voted on, what they all, the consensus at the moment, mm -hmm. because do remember, scientists are always making new discoveries, so we're always changing our minds. That's right. And one last what comment, Cal. Hmm. Um, we tend, there was a question about when is the contest and we, we wait and we wrap up the um, webinar files that we have to do and then we sort through and Cal notifies the um, winner by email with the e-kit. Yep. So, so I will add that 
if anybody didn't submit your um, email address because you couldn't do it privately, um, I will type in a secret code. Let's see if I can do it. All right, if you didn't, oh no, could everybody? I shouldn't try and figure out Zoom yep, on the I, fly. I got nine, I got nine, nine or 10 email addresses. So okay. several folks put them in and uh, we got some emails earlier for the password so we can enter those in there as well. Excellent. Awesome. All right, well, thank you everybody. Hope you enjoyed it and we will be back on Thursday. Um, it'll be a little bit more geared toward older kids, um, but if you think you wanna, you know, see how it, uh, how you do with it, um, join us. And if you do know any older kids who are interested or grown-ups, there is a scientific article to read before Thursday. So it's kind of like doing your homework in advance and then come into class. Um, and I will sign off with the dolphin riddle. Is everybody ready? Okay. <laughs> All, and I'll get it right this time. <laughs> All dolphins are whales but not all whales are dolphins. And that was a special, and, special repeat for my friends at Sunnyside Up, which is my preschool alma mater who joined us today. Woohoo! Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks, Cal. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>